Asalaamu As Alaikum. I'm going to talk very specifically about corporate governance in the context of the independence of the Board Audit Committee. And this is a brief overview of my short presentation. Corporate governance is something which often comes over as very abstract and I believe in talking about it in a way that is as concrete and as real as possible because it exists to solve or to deal with some fundamental problems which we'll see once we start looking at the ownership structures. But first of all, when you spend 35 years as a professional tax advisor, you're always worried about the risk of litigation. Now, there's no danger of anybody suing me for anything that I might say in this presentation, but there is a different danger, which is attributing my comments to the many organizations that I belong to. So I want to emphasize that I'm speaking in a purely personal capacity. My background in corporate governance comes primarily from my role at PricewaterhouseCoopers, both on the professional side of the table, looking at client audit committees in progress when you're presenting to them, but also I've been on the opposite side of the table at Salford University, at Manchester Training Enterprise Council. And the most interesting one was the six and a half years I spent as a member of the PricewaterhouseCoopers Supervisory Board. Because a partnership in the United Kingdom, like PricewaterhouseCoopers, has its own governance challenges. You have a thousand partners, and they can't run the firm effectively as a committee of 1,000. It would be utterly impossible. You can never keep anything secret. So they elect a senior partner, chairman, and give him enormous management authority, like a president. Sometimes I compare him to a dictator. But once you've given somebody so much power, how do you keep watch over that person? And so what the partners also do is elect 15 ordinary partners from amongst themselves, partners who do not report directly to the senior partner in their internal firm management roles, and they act effectively as if they were independent non-executives of PricewaterhouseCoopers, even though they're not independent at all because they're partners in the firm. I've also seen corporate governance in many voluntary sector organizations that I've been involved with. And I write quite regularly on this and related subjects on my website. So I want to look at some simple ownership structures. Let's start with the most basic. I want you to imagine somebody aged about 18, 19, 20, an adult, but with no financial business background, whose father has just died and left him with the ownership of a very large, successful business. This son is in no position to run that business. He doesn't have the skills. He doesn't have the knowledge. He may not even have the interest, but he doesn't want to sell it to somebody else. What does he do? He has to find somebody who can supervise that business on his behalf. The staff, the executive directors will be running that business, but they have all the possibility of going haywire. Selecting even one non-executive director by itself would not be enough because you have the risk, how does that single non-executive director, how do you control them, can you have confidence? So you need to select a group of them. They clearly are all, as non-executive directors, responsible to the owner. And similarly, the auditor. Of course, we're used to the auditor being a legal statutory requirement. It's a statutory requirement in the UK. It's a statutory requirement in every jurisdiction that has listed companies. But historically, auditors came about before there were statutory requirements because it's another way of 
ensuring that the people who run that company are not misbehaving because the auditor is an independent third party and in this case would be appointed by the owner based upon the advice of the non-executive directors. So that is what I would start off with as the basic sort of corporate governance model. And this applies regardless of whether, as in the United Kingdom or Saudi Arabia, you have a unitary board, in which case clearly you want to have more non-executives who are responsible solely to the owner and are not involved in running the business day to day, then you have executive directors. If you have the German model of a supervisory board, then of course the non-executive directors would be the supervisory board. Moving on now to a situation where you've got more than one remote owner. In this case, I've chosen to have three, but any other set where you've got a small number of very large shareholders. Again, they've got the same corporate governance challenge because they're not running the business themselves and they will appoint the non-executive directors. It's quite common in this situation for them to appoint one non-executive director each or two non-executive directors each and those non-executives they're independent of the running company but they may not be independent of the remote owner at all. For example where you have a company that is owned by one or several management buyout organizations, uh, venture, uh, private equity firms, they will typically appoint members of staff or third parties to be non-executive directors of the companies that they're investing in. And again, the audited responsibility is fundamentally to the shareholders via the non-executive directors. It starts to become more challenging once you bring in public shareholders, particularly dispersed public shareholders, while still having a single preponderant shareholder. And here I've shown a 55% ownership, but even if that was 40% ownership, if you own 40% of a company and the other 60% of the shares are dispersed widely held, in practice you have operational control. That's why everybody talks about Warren Buffett controlling Berkshire Hathaway, even though from, from memory his ownership stake is about 37%. And here you now have a second risk. You, you have the first risk, management misbehavior, which has been present has been present on all of the scenarios we've looked at, whether you had a single owner, whether you had three main owners, but now you have a second risk, which is of the 55% owner using his operational control to dis extract more than 55% of the benefits from this company. For example, by charging excessive fees, Although Warren Buffett personally has only ever charged $100,000 a year for being the best investment manager in history, or by trading with a business owned by the owner on non-arm's length terms. And in this scenario, I think preventing two is the most important task of, non, of the non-executives, even though they are going to be elected by a vote of the shareholders, and that's the shareholder vote which is controlled by the 55% owner. And already we can see how this starts to present serious, challenging governance problems. Again, the auditor is there to report to the non-executives on behalf of the shareholders as a whole. But again, the auditor needs to always remember the responsibility that they have to the small public shareholders even though it is the 55% owner that is in a position to decide whether the auditor is retained or changed. And then a very different kind of governance challenge when all of the shareholders are small public shareholders. And this is a challenge you see most extremely, not actually with listed public companies, but with large mutual organizations. I'm not aware if 
Saudi Arabia has many large mutuals, but the United Kingdom and many European countries have mutuals. For example, in the United Kingdom, it's quite common for insurance companies, traditionally, not to be joint stock companies, but to be mutuals where every policyholder has a single vote for electing ma management and directors, regardless of whether they have a large policy or a small policy. And the fundamental risk in that environment is apathy on behalf of the shareholders who have the voting power. Because when your shareholding is very small, even with a public company, you may own a thousand pounds worth of shares, you have very little incentive to spend time reading the financial statements, making sure that you vote in every meeting of every general meeting of shareholders. And there is an enormous risk of dominance by management. And in this situation, it's exceptionally important for the non-executive directors to prevent the environment being dominated by management. And this comes back to issues which we can discuss later on about whether management should have any presence on the audit committee. In my view, they should have no presence whatsoever. Clearly, audit committee meetings will often need to have the CEO and the CFO present for information purposes. But I believe that the only voting members of an audit committee should be the non-executive directors. That was the case, for example, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where only the supervisory board members were the voting members of the audit committee. That was the same with Salford University, with Manchester Training and Enterprise Council. So these are the different kinds of challenges that I see for corporate governance, depending upon the ownership structure. And that is actually all I want to say in the presentation. I look forward to the discussion later on. So now I will stop screen sharing.